with the shrimp boats tied up to the piling. So we got the famous Joe RV here today. It's well, about famous. infamous. infamous. <laughs> well, I'm going to say famous. There's other people that are infamous, like John Paul Sr. is definitely infamous. But we're here in Gainesville and uh, meeting Joe for the first time. And uh, he used to be with the Key West Police Department. He was a rookie at the time we ran into him. Met Chavez Paul on a call. He's already been interviewed on my podcast. It's the first time we've interviewed you in person. So um, it's great to meet you finally. You know, you live not too far. I'm from, from Swanee County originally, yeah, which right. is about 35, 40 miles from here. Yeah, so um, this is um, a different part of Florida that I uh, haven't driven through, but I haven't spent any time here. And uh, what I understand, a lot of people don't like South Florida. But, you know, I was born and raised there, so I can't change that. <laughs> And, you know, we are a melting pot. I don't know what it's like here. I haven't gone into the town to see, but I hear that, you know, it's a college town where we're at. So. This is definitely a college town, and uh, I started coming here in the summer of 1970. It was my first exposure to Gainesville, yeah. the college itself, and it, it was a totally different town than what it is today. Right, right. And it was... Uh, Kind of funky and unique right. back and they had wonderful restaurants and the student union and it was just a great place for a high school kid to come and spend some time there. Yeah. Here the, the campus is beautiful and uh, I've been stay downtown. The Marriott's I've stayed at before uh, like Key West is awesome. Mm-hmm. What's your fond memories of Key West? Well, I first initially was transferred to Key West with the Florida Department of Corrections. And I initially I was living on Big Pine Key. And this was in late 78, early 79. Um, and I spent my off duty time snorkeling and diving and uh, exploring the backcountry of the Keys. And Big Pine Key, of course, is a great place to experience the backcountry because you're right there in the middle of it. Right. You were in the Department of Corrections, but then you got into law enforcement. You got recruited? uh, November of 1979, um, there had been a big shakeup on the Key West Police Department, and practically every detective had been arrested and sent to federal prison. And it was a big joke. Um, who, who got arrested? Most of the detectives. Yeah, because they were involved in drug they, smuggling. They were involved in drug smuggling. They, they went down, that. and there was a shortage of uniform officers. Uh, and I put my application in initially as a joke. And within two weeks, they were calling me you know, when I could start. Really? So I went ahead and gave a two-week notice, and uh, I actually started my first day on the job with the police department. It was December 7, 1979. There was a lot of drug wars going on in Miami, too, with the Cubans and the Colombians, and then the Colombians decided to work directly to cut the Cubans out, which, you know, the U.S. is predominantly Cuban, so there was um, a lot of turmoil, even in... Um, Bimini, where I had an aunt and uncle who owned a house over there that um, was called, it hit the newspapers, called it the Cuban house, where my uncle sold it to a, um, a corporation from Hialeah, and he got the deposit money, and it was on, it was on the island off of where the, the um, airport was, but they didn't have a, a lit runway, so they, it was hit or miss at night. They did the deliveries at night. So apparently they had a delivery coming at night and they used the house as a stash house. And there was a big fight and they burned down the house, I guess to get rid of the evidence or whatever. And um, so my uncle said that nobody came to claim the land. The deed wasn't transferred, so he got the house back. He got the deposit money, got the house back, and then collected all the insurance on the house and then turned around and resold it. He made out like a bandit. 
never got involved in drugs because they owned a prominent restaurant. They ran the, um, the hotel there, the Cardion, the yeah. big game club. But I used to go there and I, I used to see uh, the Bahamian police officers bringing in little boats with tons of bales of marijuana, you know, with their guns. <laughs> And you often wonder, are you taking that to confiscate or are you taking that to resell it? Because that was predominantly going on in uh, all over South Florida, too. It was, it was greed in the sense. So, um, we, are, we talked about before about, you know, when you, when you ran into Chalice at um, Howard Johnson's, right? That was on Overseas Highway. Right, on US 1 in Key West. And she... Had already been staying there for a week? I don't know if it was a week. It was at least four days that yeah. she had been there. And then um, she checked in on the John Paul's credit card. Yes, yeah, she was using an American Express call. I remember that yeah. uh, distinctively that right. she had an American Express call. She had a dark blue Audi with her? She had a beautiful Audi 5000 uh, or a fourth, a quattro. An Audi Quattro. Okay, because that, um, that car actually, I found out, was introduced with in conversation with Michael Paul, that that car did make it back into John's possession, and he actually drove it to a race up north, and um, he drove the hell out of the car. So I haven't followed up on that to find the race and the timeline and everything, but it certainly after she disappeared. But so he was able to acquire the car back, which makes sense that he probably had an extra set of keys if he told her to go to the airport, leave it in the, in the uh, you know, the garage there, and then he could go and pick up the car and take it back. You know, we don't know 100% because we don't have records of her flight itinerary, but she could have drove there and then he drove the car back to Atlanta as well. So, but that played an integral part in my timeline of events about the because she told me you knew it was in his name. Right. It was, I distinctly recall, because I'm a, I'm a police officer, I'm inherently suspicious to yeah. begin with. <laughs> so when Chalice was staying with me, I ran a check on the tag, and it came back as not stolen, but it, it was definitely registered to John Paul. So I breathed a sigh of relief at that, that the car wasn't stolen. Right. But, uh, and then, uh, Charles and I began talking and she reveals some things to me about John Paul. And one of the things that was most apparent was she was terrified of him. So she saw his anger. She was terrified of his business dealings. She feared him physically. And I just assumed that uh, she was stayed with me four or five days before she left to go to West Palm Beach, right. or to Palm Beach, rather. Yeah. And uh, uh, I just assumed that she would eventually manage the strength to divorce from John Paul right. and start her life over again. She tried that. She, she actually filed in Georgia, but 10 days later lifted it. And then filed for alimony. That's where she thought she could get a better financial benefit out of them before the divorce was finalized. But it was short lived, so I don't know, even in the, if, if they went to court together, what she would be able to acquire because they weren't married that long, you know, and they didn't have children. Um, and things were different back then. But um, she, we, have, we, we got those papers to prove the timeline. Um, what she did, and then of course it never got finalized. And now I'm hearing from Nancy Baker that he actually had business um, in Haiti, something to do with uh, baseball cards or something. I don't know. But she um, told you about me. This is very important because I I've been questioned whether by a family member, Chalices, that they didn't believe I was her friend. But you verified this in the podcast, and, and I'd like you to verify it again. She did say she was coming to West Palm to stay with you. Well, not only that, she made several phone calls from Key West, from my residence, to her friend in Palm West. Beach. Right, they had landlines. And, and uh, registration. Um, 
<clears throat> when she told me that she was going to West Palm Beach, I had a Mariner outboard motor that was on my sailboat. Right. And I had been out with some friends, and the boat had capsized, causing the motor to go underwater. So I needed the motor to be flushed out and serviced. And uh, I, she actually took the motor to Fort Lauderdale on her way to, to Palm Beach. Right. Uh, I don't, of course, I didn't recall your name at the time, but I knew that she, she talked to a woman in Palm Beach, Florida, several times, usually once a day. And uh, when I found out that she, that's where her next stop was, yeah. I asked her to drop the outboard for me to have it repaired. Right, right. And she did do that. I well, got she also mentioned Lisa because you mentioned that in the podcast. That, you know, then you put two and two together. I'm a yeah. smart girl. But you didn't do background on my phone number, or you couldn't do that. that well, no, I right? could do that. I just wasn't. I, I just didn't. Yeah. You know, because she she's described what you were involved with that you were in design and. Yeah, oh, so the yeah. thing I brought my portfolio. Yeah, so you can see she, that. she mentioned that, and uh-huh. she also mentioned that uh, you were at the time dating a professional ball player, I believe. Ball player? No, a boat captain. Okay. He's right. a treasure hunter. Okay. Yeah, and that, that I went <clears> into <throat> a dead end uh, finding him. He, and, um, you know, I. I, I I actually had a dream about this, and I'm thinking, because he said his name, he was uh, French descent, he lived in St. Bartholomew, you know, St. Bart's, down in the Caribbean, and um, he he was with an expedition, you know, like Jacques Cousteau, okay. and they had a boat docked, uh, it was Spencer Belt Boatyard at the time, my parents knew the owners of that boatyard, and now it's Ragovich, it's a high-end yachting center, it's phenomenal, but... Um, he had his, um, um, and actually Steve Carson told me this, uh, I used to call it a mind sweeper. He said, I, I used to call it ground sweepers, you know, it's a mind sweeper. It's what the original with the Coast Guard, I guess they converted it because they have glass bottom and everything mm-hmm. that they could see. And, um, you know, it was big enough for the crew and, and the man, you know, the horsepower and the engine or whatever. And so that was docked. I remember at the end of the dock, I remembered it was like dark blue. And we went board the boat and I met the, the crew and Marcel. We actually originally met on the Palm Beach Yacht Club where I met Chalice. And, you know, he was a gorgeous man, I say. <laughs> <laughs> so I started dating him. And I wasn't going to be part of the expedition, but, um, you know, he actually. Because there's piracy out there once you're a mile offshore. And, you know, they were looking for resources, too, before they, they shipped off. But they would normally sail to Key West and then from there launch off to the Caribbean. I guess they'd fuel up there. When John Paul told me after she disappeared that he left her in Key West. He said that on the phone from his place of work on the speaker. And he said, well, she's talking about some treasure hunters. Do you know anything about it? So this could have been a conversation she had. I met these people. And knowing he was a drug smuggler, he could probably access guns, right? He'd have he'd be a better source for that. So it could have been as simple as her asking him, do you have any guns? These guys are treasure hunters. They're going down to Caicos because there was a wreck there. And every treasure hunter was, was flocking there okay. at that time. You know, it was a Spanish ship. So that was something there many years ago. So it could have been as simple as a phone conversation, or if he did take it to Key West, they ran into each other, right? I mean, it would make sense. They would sail down, and it would be like timing. And um, so I was desperately trying to find him to see if that was verified, and that's what um, the officer in Key West told me um, down there. That if I could prove that she was down there and she was seen, then they would open up an active investigation. Thanks to you for making the introduction for me to get the incident report down there in 2014. But I couldn't find her. But now I, I heard his name was Marcel Burt, but maybe they just call him Marcel Bart because he's from Bartholomew and that's not really his last name, right? 
could be. Yeah, you know, they call Marcel Bart for short. But he was friends with Jimmy Buffett. So I even went, because Jimmy had his boat docked down there. Had a That's boat. right. Yeah, Jimmy kept his boat. And Palm Beach. And he had this gorgeous, like, forest green motor yacht that was dropped in beautiful. It's kind of a vintage uh, yacht that was that was docked there at the same same dock. So and uh, of course he would go to St. Bart's a lot. So they could have met there and then reunited in Palm Beach because he had a place in Palm Beach too. So I tried to go through his management and his PR thing. He never got anywhere. Now he's dead, so that's a dead end there. Um, but um, uh, if I had been able to find him, and he said, yeah, I saw it, but I have to tell you what I did experience, which was a fluke. One, and I think everything happens for a reason, and timing and everything, but here I was in, in, in Manhattan, and I had girlfriends that were models, and they didn't get invites to parties, and we were out in the Hamptons. She's very she-she. It was a famous uh, fashion photographer opened up a restaurant, so he invited all the models. So we went out there, and the guy was French, French photographer, and there was a guy there, Stefan, who was one of the, the mates. I have a photo of him, him and Marcel, that we took up at Jonathan Dixon State Park here in June. And I said, Stefan, what are you doing? I thought you were going on the expedition. And he goes, uh, no, I decided not to go. And I said, well, um, you remember Chalice? We all met Jakob? Yeah. I said, she didn't happen to hook up with you on that end because there would be no reason for her to do that. She's not a sailor. She was going back to be in Burt's Reynolds movie, Sharky's Machine. She was all excited about that. It made no sense that she would hook up with these guys and take off and go to Caicos. Okay, leave everything behind and not let anybody know she was going on an expedition with a group of, you know, treasure hunters. He goes, no, absolutely not. I haven't seen her since probably John Club days. So that blew uh, uh, John Paul Sr.'s alibi out the window. He was trying to allude that she hooked up with them in Key West. Well, one of the things that she spoke about while she was uh, in Key West is her potential acting career. Right. And she was very excited, um, I think in either late spring or the summer, she was planning on doing uh, another movie with Burt Reynolds. I right. had understood her to say that she was a member of the Actors Guild. Well, um, this would have gotten her, if she has, if you, if you speak 30 seconds as a primary extra, you're, you're qualified for SAG. Okay. But I don't know, do, do, you, do you think she already had her card? She never showed me her card that she, she had, she had one? Um, but she was going to get a small bit role. Yeah, that would have and qualified. She, that would have required her to, to you yeah, know, be, be, a, be a member. <laughs> right. So uh, I saw a cannonball run, and there was no speaking lines for her. She was an, an extra. She was a stand-in, I believe, for uh, Adrian Barbeau, who's okay. one of the lead actresses in it. But that that's... That's probably why she was so excited, because that would have launched her career into other opportunities. And she knew Mike Menavoy. I met him, which else, in Atlanta, for the screening of Excalibur. And uh, it was a, a flub movie, but he was, you know, CEO of Orion Pictures, and, and he was a heavy hitter. So, you know, she met him like many high-profile people on Delta Airlines, which she flew mostly um, managed, you know, um, first class. As a, as a flight attendant, and um, she met a lot. She met, she knew Ted Turner from Jacksonville days. Right. Like, she mentioned that she knew Ted Turner. And his boat was down there too, tenacious. And the she one also that mentioned Americans that come. she knew Burt Reynolds. That was yeah. another one that she said that she had. Um, that apparently he was a regular flyer with the airlines that right. she worked with, and that's how she initially met him. Right. And then later she was an extra in right. the Cannonball Run, I believe, was the film that she was yeah. an extra. John Paul, um, a thread on blog pages, people who were finally coming out and talking about the good old days, um, said that they used his garage for some of the scenes and they used his high performance cars. So okay. there's one particular scene, we have it on um, the, um, the website. Um, where we, we did a splice, you know, Frank did 
that um, showed her wanting to get into a, a red Ferrari. And uh, it was supposed to be Adrian Margot, but it was definitely her body type. It was her doing that. And then the scene with the, the plane that flew into some small town, I can't remember the name of it, in Georgia. Um, she had to get out of the way with another extra. And then there was another scene inside um, where a car crashed into um, the living room setting. And then Bert comes in with Dom DeLuise. Oh, hey, Dom. Sure. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, he was in it, but I, yeah, I don't know if he was in that scene. So we, we were able to find at least three clips of her in that. Um, but she also knew um, Ed Spivey. And, it, and, you know, I was always looking for him because I met him with Chalice at her flight attendant friend's house in Atlanta. And it's Spivia, but it's pronounced Spivey. Just like her old roommate, Anne Fazier. It's French, right? So I'm looking for Fazier, the way it sounds, phonetically. And it was Fazier, I-E-R. And her first name was Martha. And then she went by her middle name. That's always, as you know, in law enforcement, they always tell you, and even in PI school, always check the middle name, too. Because there's a lot of people, especially up here, I find in Chalice's family in particular, a lot of them use their middle name instead of their first name. I, I'm the same way. My, yeah. I use my middle name. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to check both if you're doing background because, you know, don't just take for granted that the first name is the name that you are using for identification. So, um, she um, uh, she never came, went back for that part, and I knew it was a red flag she was supposed to meet with me in Florida because I was flying home to see my parents. And she met my parents prior. She met my brothers. Were here. I had a brother who was overseas in the service, but she met what family was living here. And uh, uh, I was nervous about her going, and Anne was the same way. Anne um, remembers the phone call I had with her. She was there, she heard it, and she was trying to discourage her, so was I, because I said, I don't have a good feeling about this. Don't go, don't go. Oh no, it's like we've, you know, we're going on a second honeymoon. So I can only assume she had visited her in the house a few times because Anne and and son remembered this black Mercedes that showed up and, and the son went out and was talking about the car and it was so cool. And um, maybe it was blue, I'm not sure, but um, he he obviously was warming her up for premeditated murder in my opinion, okay, to get her to go to Florida because if you got her in a body of water, you knew how to get rid of her. Very easy. And there's no tricks. So he was an avid sailor. He knew the waters, he knew the channels. He sold the Atlantic more than once. I'm sure that's what happened to Colleen Wood, too. And she was last seen with him. He was. So, so yeah, serial killers use the same MO, right? I believe that to be true. Yeah. I ran across in, during my career uh, one in particular that had been involved in smuggling, and he had intentionally pushed a Colombian off his boat that while they were bringing in a um, boatload of marijuana and uh, it haunted him the rest of his life because he, this Colombian he knew was killed and he uh, to avoid being caught with a Colombian on his boat he didn't mind being caught with a load of marijuana but he didn't for some reason want to be caught with a so he shot the Colombian and pushed his body off the boat. Apparently, the body never was found. Of course. And, uh, uh, but it, that it just seemed to be so common among the drug smugglers that, you know, they would go out on these trips and grab loads of pot. And if someone crossed them in some way, they would, you know, push them over the side. Yeah. Fend for yourself. Even if yeah. they don't shoot them. You know, your shark bait eventually, you know, you yeah. drown. You know, you know, your body can't stay on the surface that long. It, about 12 hours maximum is uh, yeah. about as long as a body can stand to be in, in, in water constantly like that. Yeah, well, it's it's scary thought. You never go out on a boat with somebody you don't trust or know. You need to know how to operate that boat and 
set sails and everything. I mean, it, 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 it's a dangerous sport, sailing in particular. But yeah, well, I found that, that odd because I had a sailboat when, uh, in fact, it was docked right there where I lived at. And uh, I tried to get Chalice to go sailing with me a couple of times, and she seemed to be fearful of it. Now, granted, it was a much smaller boat than what she did. It was a 22-foot coffin and sloop. She didn't want to go out. But she did not want to go out on the boat. I think she knew about other crimes he did, he, that he committed murder before, but she just didn't want me to know because she said, he's, he's a dangerous man, he likes, he likes to live on the edge of the razor, and, you know, He's had blood on his hands more than once. They said, I distinctly remember her saying that. And that is what triggered me to get nervous about her reuniting with him. Because she came to Palm Beach. She came to Palm Beach because she, you know, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous is out, Robin Beach. So, of course, Palm Beach looks like a fantasy destination, kind of like going to Hawaii. You don't think anything's going to happen to you. It's paradise, right? So she wanted to go down to explore, to see Palm Beach, because she came from a very poor family. And of course, wealth always in power intrigued her, you could tell. That's what the attraction was with John Paul. And, uh, you know, we hit it off. I mean, she was having a blast. And I said, well, why don't you just stay here? But then, you know, we got we bonded. And then I said, well, I got to go pursue my career, you know. I, want to go to Manhattan. I've already gone to visit. And she goes, well, I think I might move up there with you. So this was a consideration. I got a little matchbox apartment, you know, in Midtown. But, you know, I said, when are you coming up? And then <clears throat> she was saying, well, I'm, I'm going to get back together with John Paul. I said, what? You know, yeah, he invited me to Florida, but don't worry, I'm going only for a week and I'm going back to the Bird's movie. <clears throat> and I said, well, contact my family. She never did. So, and um, when we finally talked, I went through way with Chalice's sister Charlene, and poor Charlene was so shook up because I got lost in on the phone because I distinctly remember our last words. You know, she says, you know, I always love you, you've been a good friend, and I'll never forget, you know, you helping me out. And uh, that was the last time I ever talked to her, so it's, it's, it's emotional for me because if she had lived, we would have probably lived our whole life together, you know, and still been talking on the phone to this day, you know, about what you're going on. And I, I, I have no doubt she would have made it as an actress in Hollywood. And I think that was a threat to him, too, because he didn't want anybody to outshine him, especially a woman who was assertive and gorgeous like she was. In fact, when she got married, you know, on Lime Rock Park prior to the ceremony, she would walk around with a t-shirt saying, I'm the boss, and women of the racing circuit were laughing. So, yeah, wonder how long that'll last, you know? <laughs> I know I, <clears throat> throughout my law enforcement career, I've um, been an avid moviegoer, and I would always stay and watch the credits at the end of the film, expecting to see Chalice's name on the credits somewhere. Right. Um, and of course, I never did. But even uh, after I retired from the police department um, and moved back to North Florida, I would still, when I would attend a movie, always set through the credits to uh, see if I saw some challenges. Right, right. You know. Was, well, she knows she used Barrett because her her first married name was Barnett. She thought Barrett was a softer sound, and so she wanted to do the hyphen Barrett hyphen Paul. She didn't want to just be Chalice Paul, but I thought Chalice Paul, for advertising purposes, was short, simple, Paul, the Paul family, the racers, it was a famous name. Um, it would catch people's attention. And we're hoping that we can do a film on this because I don't think, what do you think, Joe? you think any law enforcement, because I, I've hit a dead end, nobody wants a cold case on their desk, nobody. Unless we get a very skilled former detective who has nothing to do and he has a lot of time in his hands and he's as tenacious as I am to push this through. My impression is that eventually somebody in John Paul's family would be willing to come forward with information on either John Paul's where current whereabouts, his exact whereabouts, 
I question as to whether or not he's still there. I think he is. Um, someone in his family knows the truth. Yeah, his uh, his his daughter would hope. Hey, but I believe she went to the yeah. wisdom in Thailand. But you know, Hope is living in um, Mexico. Why is she living in Mexico? That's a question too. Is I mean. Obviously, her daughter's an heir to his money, so is Michael, but he doesn't give a crap about Michael. He could care less if Mike died tomorrow. He, he never cared. And, and John Paul Jr. was, you know, the fair haired boy, more or less. And he died, and, and they didn't even invite Mike to any sort of celebration of life. The significant other caregiver. It was sad, but, you know, Mike's gotten the short end of the stick. Um, they just see him as a throwaway. And it's sad because he's actually a good soul and he doesn't have a mean bone in his body. And uh, he's suffering mentally because of the past and guilt ridden because he's the only one that didn't get Huntington's disease. There was one person that I've heard rumors of is that John Paul was friend with an Atlanta police officer. Really? And that that officer used to sail with him on his boat. But I don't know this person's name, uh-huh. um, but if he's still living, he could probably provide some information. Um, but I think that Hurley Haywood, who's a famous racer, whose sister was Hope, but married John Paul when he was still legally married to Chalice, I think they have information that he's used to give up. I think John Paul Jr.'s former wife as well. Who you know has you know dangled carrots to me about information and then tells me half truths. So um, I'm finding her credibility is questionable, but uh, I believe she knows a lot more, especially about covering up for Chalice's disappearance and her clothing too. I mean, you know, it's a uh, it's a known fact that serial killers like to take something from some a person that they kill. It's like a trophy to them. And her halter top has been verified by two family members, Trish Paul and Michael Paul. Tanya Paul, who's now dead, her daughter, wore her halter top. And that top was what I met her in. It's in it's on the podcast, I mean it's on the uh, website and it was a metal and it just draped low and there was two distinct pieces of clothing that she had when she was in Key West that I distinctly remember. One of them was a mink coat. Right. Yeah. As she wore. I stayed in Atlanta at, at Ann's house. And the other one was the metal or metal appearing halter top. That's and, it. and that's what she would wear. She loved that top. She loved that loved top. Loved it. She would never give that away. Trish was trying to say, oh, well, Michigan. No, she would not give that away. If she came down in the summer, she would bring that top. But even if she came in the winter, she'd wear the fur coat over it. Right. Because that's how I met her in the winter. On the chalk club. She had um, black slacks, that halter top, and her, and her fur coat. And she was dropped in gorgeous. She walked in the room and peeked into her Oh, everyone would stop and look. Yeah, she, she had the charisma. She had the look. She was using my car. Um, and in one instance, she came to the police station to pick me up after I got off duty, which was 11 p.m., and walked into the station to find me. And everyone's straw dropped when she walked in because she was wearing the halter top with the mink coat. And, uh, I mean, it was really stunning how fit that she wore. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, people were talking, you know, what is that woman doing with that slot, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you were a young guy then. Yeah, I was young and dumb and, you know, uh, and it oh, you're, was... You are helping her. She felt safe around you. You were law enforcement. I'm sure that that was, um, you know, a comfort level for her at that time. But um, um, her, also her wedding ring, according to Trish Paul, was given to her and an embellished um, pendant on a necklace, which I verified with um, Chalice's sister Charlene that she did take the state key from the Queen um, Elizabeth to that they sailed after they got married to go to Le Mans, France. She didn't know that his other girlfriend was in another state room, Annie, at the time. She found out Annie was there when she got there. That's another story. But um, she 
took the key and embellished it with um, gems, and it could have been diamonds and rubies according to Charlene. I'm not sure, but the irony that Junior would get that from his father and give it to his wife, and he gave the top to Tanya. I mean, that just blows me away. And I thought that that would be significant evidence. So I was desperately trying to talk to Tanya, Tanya Paul because she passed away in Indiana. I was getting roadblocks from a guy who was claiming to be the middleman for her care, and I'm finding out now that wasn't true. Um, didn't have any relationship or communication with Michael. And of course, John Paul Jr. would never talk to me. I had two sightings of him. Um, once, the first first time was when I actually I was working at uh, Polo Club uh, during the polo matches at Wellington, and we had a house out there. And that was when I said, you know, uh, it was Chalice's friend, and it was one of, do you have any information about her? He goes, no, but I'm sure that the prosecuting attorney saying, obviously would love to talk to you, because that's when they already extradited Caesar back, and he was in the holding cell up there, waiting to stand trial. So that's when um, I left there, and I was trying to reach out to the state attorney's office up there to just give him information what I knew about Chalice. Nothing about his attempted escape, because he had already attempted to escape from there. And... Um, wouldn't you know, they kept me on the phone. All of a sudden, I see a sheriff's helicopter hanging over my head. As they tapped the line on the case. It was outside, you know? So I look at oh my God, you know? <laughs> Ran in the restaurant and sat there at the bar and said, oh, they're going to come and question me. But I didn't know anything about his attempt at escape. I had nothing to do with John Paul. I just knew Chalice, you know, for that short while. So, um, when I told my father, he said, he's going, Liz, you don't want your junior to meet with us. No, I'm telling you, Dad, for real. This helicopter, like, you know, they're, they've got binoculars on me, you know, and then they finally relayed the information. She doesn't know anything, and then flew away. So uh, <laughs> that was interesting. But um, um, the second sighting of John Paul Jr. was after he got out of prison, and he got uh, endorsed by R.C. Cola and a man by Phil Conte. He lived in Singer Island not far from me, and, and um, they were doing a Grand Prix race downtown, uh, West Palm on the streets, first time they ever did it. And I worked uh, for Richard Branson in a private club on the top of the, we call it the Dark Bader building. It was all black, you know, it looked like you know, Dark Bader from Star Wars. And so uh, they were doing a silent auction, and they used that space, the restaurant portion of that. I worked on the club side. So I just went, boldly went up and said, hi, you remember me? You met me at your house. I was Chalice's friend. Oh, by the way, I went back to Atlanta and I met with Ed Spivey and we had lunch and he told me he heard that she was declared legally dead and all her personal belongings were, were sold. And his face turned white, like, what? And I, what Ed told me wasn't true. It must have been a rumor he heard. Um, but he, he like, I'm out of here. So he grabbed his wife. That's the first time I locked eyes on Trish when they were leaving, going down the elevator. And she never, never had words. And then, of course, years later, I interviewed her. And then I said, well, what happened when you know I confronted them at uh, Roof Gardens, was the name of the place? She goes, oh, that's that same bitch that keeps surfacing all the time asking questions about Chalice. That was his reaction to his wife. So obviously, there was no love loss there. He could care less. And that's the most disgusting part about that family, that they never acknowledged or had any concern for somebody else's uh, life that was involved with their father. It, it's very, very sad. It's sad. And it is. I mean, sad. you know, he, he's living the lap of luxury. Well, here he's dead. We're alive, right? We're here talking. But, you know, he got a terrible disease, and he didn't even take it to the end. He... Um, uh, did assisted suicide in California because they allow it. Uh, which, in a way, I don't blame them because, you know, it's a debilitating disease. Um, Tanya took it to the end, and the mother did, and Michael took care of both of them, both the women and so uh, John Paul Jr. never did anything. So John Paul Jr. got the fame, the glory, the money, the recognition, um, had the wife and kids, left them for this woman, and moved to California, and then profiteered off his sickness, and she did too. They, you know, 
who was in love with John Paul Jr., but it didn't want to total denial about him having any knowledge about his father's crimes. Well, he was involved in his crimes in the drug smuggling, as you know. So, and I've uncovered other things as well. You know, he met up with a guy who, what he thinks he was earmarked to be knocked off the same night they shot Stephen Carson. And he was orchestrated by his senior to come down to St. Augustine checking out hotel. And he did with his wife. And um, after he shot Stephen Carson, he fled and he called him and he says, uh, uh, I can't see you right now, I'll see you down in Coconut Grove. And he hauled butt and called Coconut Grove, see him because he had to create an alibi. Oh, I wasn't even in St. Augustine, I was in Coconut Grove, right? And that didn't pan out because the feds went in investigated and, and questioned all those people down there and of course they're not going to go to jail for him to cover his ass so um, um, this guy was orchestrated prior to that to meet at Hurley Haywood's dealership to pick up a brand new Mercedes and drive it to New Orleans and um, he checked into a motel there and Junior met him and had a million dollars in cash in an attaché case to get him to give to uh, the lawyer who was representing the five defendants, which is my son, thank you, lucky five, um, for their uh, bond, cash bond in total. So the um, charges went away. That was the Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. So, we, you know, and Michael Paul already disclosed they had their own deal. Yeah, it was, it was corruption, as you yeah. know. There was down in Key West. So you had, you know, a dirty judge, dirty sheriff, and you had a dirty lawyer, and then that lawyer became a Supreme Court justice, which is ironic, okay? And then he got investigated by the FBI involving, you know, special deals he made with drug smugglers. So, um, yeah, it's a revolving door. But... That, that guy still is nervous, you know, about John Paul, because he believes that he had this knowledge and he'd come after it. Well, there's statute of limitations. There's nothing going to happen there, you know, as far as him delivering a car of money, right? What's going to happen to him? But he's lucky to be alive, because he says, I really think because of him doing that act, and he got orders from the authorities in Louisiana to... Don't connect us with any of this, right? So he was a delivery man, so it makes sense. He's not going to knock off his own son, who's the star racer. He's going to get rid of the guy who delivered the car and delivered the money. So there would be a motive there, is what I'm trying to say, for him to get rid of him. But, uh, yeah, it's it's um, it's an interesting story, to say the least. So what, what do you it's think? Quite a web. What, what do you think the outcome's going to be? He gets away with it, and it's just a story for the rest of our lives that we can tell. We well, can I, would, <laughs> I personally would like to see closure. You know, I, of course. I think everyone that's concerned about this on that new challenge uh, knew that she had a heart of gold and knew that she wanted to do the right thing. Um, She but, told you about Louisiana. Oh, yes. I, I, knew, same I knew about, this was about yeah. the same time. You met her. That's when the bus went down. all this was going on. Yeah. And she told me about a conversation with John Paul Jr. I, he couldn't have been more than 18 or 19 years old at the time. Right. And she told me how he had been arrested uh, with a group of other men and somehow John Paul himself and managed to elude the uh, law enforcement people that were there. But John Paul Jr. had been one of the ones that had been arrested in Louisiana. And I, is she, I think she mentioned that he had to go to sentencing him. But as far as I know, I'm not sure what the out, actual outcome of that case was. Well, that, that actually, there, there was two busts. And the one I think that she was referring to you was when they caught them with the smell of marijuana and there was a, a boat that was called the Lady Ro Royale that was out in the bayou and it was registered for John Smith, whatever. John Drew, I think that was his alias. 
John and Paul Jr. used. Um, and um, they found marijuana down the street, so they picked him up, but he had a fake identification, his passport or whatever. So that was kind of a slap on the wrist. They paid a fine, got away with that. So that might have been that first bus. Um, the second bus was, was later. That was involving five people, and there was a little more involved. And actually, he wasn't one of the five defendants on the second one. But John Paul was there. He fled. He took off with the Colombian. Because when you mention the Colombian, get thrown overboard. The Colombians will send one of their own with them for insurance. With, blood, right. with insurance. So they could be the eyes and ears to report back that the delivery went through or there was a bust and, you know, they had a flea, whatever. Um, so that was very common, I guess, in, in their, um, their dealing, you know, with uh, the Colombians. And so they did find that boat and they closed the uh, drawbridge so no other boat could leave. And then they saw the boat that had uh, delivered the loads. The guys jumped overboard and it was freezing water. And they fished them out of the, the water and brought them in. I've got the uh, state police report on that. So I read it excessively and know exactly what happened. But, but the guy who was uh, um, had the semi truck with the loads in it, he's missing. And he married John Paul Sr.'s first wife, Earl Thrower. And his nickname was Butch. He went by Butch. But his real, real full name is Earl Houston Thrower. He's from Murfreesboro, uh, Tennessee. And he actually married Joyce and they lived together in Muncie. She got him involved in the drug smuggling operation. So he hit the fence when he was leaving at the gate and a um, uh, neighbor got tipped off because of the sound of the truck running at four in the morning. Then the man that owned the property snuck in. It was in the pitch of the dark. He saw the guys loading onto the, the truck. And then he casually asked somebody and they said uh, they were working on the pipeline and unloading uh, whatever. So they, they pulled him over and they busted him, but then he tried to go solo and do his own deal in, in Tennessee and showed up being flashy with uh, seeing this red Porsche and, you know, some little town, I guess they, they knew he was doing something illegal. And then he tried to make a deal there and there were undercover cops. <laughs> he made the deal with, so he got busted. Then he got in trouble up in, uh, uh, Muncie, um, uh, Speedy and, and eluding police and had cocaine on him and everything. So I, I'm sure John Paul saw him as a loose cannon. And he was always telling, because I spoke to his first wife, um, and he since divorced him and then he married Joyce for, you know, only married for a year. And he said he had a separate deal. That's what he told the people, because he told everybody about the bus in Louisiana, you know, his hometown, but, you know, he said he had a separate deal. So he might have been going to roll over on John Paul, so I'm sure there's a motive there to get rid of him, just like David Kasora. So, you know, this has uh, been quite a journey, you know, because there's been these people that have gone missing. The family's not doing anything about it. They just let it go, which shocks me, because if I had somebody missing my family, I'd be pursuing it. And Chalice wasn't. I considered her a good friend at the time, but it was short lived. But I mean, I wasn't blood related to her. And look how far I've gone with this just for one person. But now there's four that are missing. And a possible guy landed on the shores of Spain that used to play pool with Michael Paul in Merritt Island, Brevard County. And he said his father showed him a newspaper article saying, look what happened to Bubba. He goes, why did, it, why did that happen? He goes, because he pissed me off. So there you go. We don't know how many. There could be tons of people out in the middle of the ocean that he sailed, you know, throw away people. Oh, you come help me with the sail and then right. you know, in the drink, right? Well, listen, it's been a pleasure uh, meeting you and talking to you. We're going to spend the day together, I hope. You have to be Lansley. I have no plans. I, I've cleared my schedule. This concludes our one on one with Joe Arby. And I appreciate it very much, Joe. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, anytime. Anytime. I'm so glad. I've been talking about coming up here for years, and I'm glad that I finally do it. But, you know, people are getting old. 
Yes, they are. People are dying. When I heard <laughs> that Jimmy dying, Buffett yeah. died, I went, oh my God, I missed my calling there about this boat captain. But maybe that was a dead end anyway, so who knows. But anyways, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh